Okay, so my paper was on enabling network security through active DNS data sets. It was put together by a group of researchers at the Georgia Institute of Technology and was presented during the RAID 2016 conference. So it is important to note that the data for this does span the length of time between 2015 and 2016. So it is about five, five four to five years old. Um, the domain name system, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because some of our other papers have already covered how the DNS system works. Um, it is a fundamental component of the internet. Its basic function is to map domain names to IP addresses and it provides network agility to many different organizations. So basically it allows a, a sense of security through different network things because a lot of the IP addresses are hidden behind URLs and domain names and it's the DNS server that actually is the one that actually resolves all of that. So when does DNS become a problem? DNS is frequently leveraged by cyber criminals. A lot of malware relies on DNS to locate the command and control servers, which often are controlled by the attacker. The attacker themselves tends to issue commands as well as updates to the malware via these servers. Current solutions for different malware solutions rely on static blacklists. These blacklists are manually compiled based on people either reporting that they're spam, they're malware, and they don't scale very easily because it's something that has to be reported, checked, and then ultimately ends up on the blacklist. Some of the proposed systems that they did come out with ended up being problematic because they relied on efficient collection and presentation of passive DNS data sets. Existing data sets to use for some of these systems as a base were difficult to find and they're also challenging to collect information because there's a lot of restrictive legal arrangements on collecting some of this data. And actually for my final, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these arrangements because it pulls into that as well. Um, so the authors of my paper proposed a solution that they called Thales. And it's a large scale active DNS system that systematically queries and collects large amounts of data. It outputs the information as a distilled data set and it does not contain any potentially sensitive information. So where some of the other people that tried to come up with solutions to gathering data ran into problems, because this doesn't contain sensitive information, they're able to work around a lot of the legal restrictions. The importance of the purpose of this is to reliably collect and analyze large amounts of data with virtually no downtime several times a day. They wanted to provide greater breadth and reach in different IPv4, IPv6, and DNS spaces compared with passive DNS data. And ultimately, they did this to improve the security of modern networks. The infrastructure of Thales is based on two main areas, the traffic generator, which is most of this particular part of it generates large numbers of DNS queries using the seed domain input. The data collector, which is on this side of it, collects the network data from two different points. One is coming from the traffic generator. The other one is from the network and the internet itself. And it guides the raw information that it has to processing and finally storage in a 22 node Hadoop cluster. The traffic generator is fueled by the main part of it called the domain seed. This has two pieces. The seed API is responsible for collecting seed domains from various sources. So they put together an aggregation of publicly accessible sources of domain names and URLs by going to a few different things. They had public blacklists. And you can see they chose a selection of some of them. This does not include all of the public blacklists. They chose to choose about seven of them. 
They use the top level domain files that are published daily by the administrators of .com, .net, .biz, and .org domains. Each one of these zone files contain about 127 million domains. They then went to a security vendor that had domains that have been observed to engage in forms of potentially malicious activity, which is about 1.5 billion domains. They used the Alexa list as a basis for domains that are likely to be queried in a network by users. And they also tapped into the Common Crawl project, which is an open repository of web crawler data. They built and deployed a crawler as part of this API to grab URLs and HTML code from this data. They then took all of these and fed it into the seed generation piece, which takes everything that's been input to it and it reduces it down to a unique list of domains. So anything that's duplicated, it removes. So that way all the pieces in here are unique. The scanning cluster is a, set, a series of Linux containers, which are set up across several physical systems. For the purpose of this paper, they used two physical systems, each with 64 processing cores and 164 gigabytes of RAM. They used 30 contiguous IP addresses out of a block of 63 on a class C network that would split into four subnets. Each container is running a software called Unbound, which is a recursive software, and it's open source. Um, I put the website address there in case anyone wants to take a look at it. Subsets of the overall data, because it's so large, it needs to be split up into pieces. So each one of these containers has a specific job and a specific subset that it's responsible for. The requests sent from each one of these hosts are bound by the max number of ports that can be used for UDP sockets. And it's easily scaled by simply adding more containers to the cluster. The network span, which back on my original slide was a blue piece that connects both of them, both the internet as well as the, the traffic generator. It's the span of a switch that routes traffic for all of the containers. Several VLANs where these containers are trunked to a single one gig interface that collects port 53 UDP traffic. It controls query generation and it sends traffic on two interfaces to the data collector. One, as I mentioned before, the internet, the second traffic generator data. And they did this for redundancy and verification of data to ensure that both places that were coming in were similar and weren't, it wasn't missing anything. So they wanted to make sure that data was being sent from both directions to ensure that some data that was coming in through the internet, maybe it might not have been processed, it got collected as well. The data collector takes all of the raw DNS data that comes in from the network span and extracts the following information. Now these are pieces of the DNS record, the date, which is the date the record was accessed, the queue name, which is the full domain query name, the queue type, which is the type of query information to be returned. Each record type has a specific query for example, A records have a type ID of one, NS records, which are name server records, have an ID of two, pointer records, 12, and so on. I put a wiki list there in case any of you are interested in seeing the additional queries that you can do when it calls out to a DNS server. And then our data is the content that's returned by the query type. So if you're looking for a uh, type ID of one, which is an A record, it'll return an IPv4 address that the name resolves to. TTL, time to live, the field represents the amount of time in seconds the record is considered to be valid. The authority IPS field, which is the authoritative name server IP addresses for the domain. The count, the number of records in the authority section of the message. Uh, hours, which is the hours of the day that the information was captured in a 24-bit integer value, and then the sensor, which is the type of sensor that is monitoring the domain's DNS server. 
for this project, the majority of these, the sensor type was active DNS. Processing and storage, the data received averages about 1.67 terabytes of raw data coming in in a PCAP format per day. It's transferred to the 22 node Hadoop cluster that parses the data, removes duplicates of resource records. It converts the data into tuples containing date, Q name, Q type, R data, time to live, authorities, and count, and then reduces the data to approximately 85 gigabytes per day. And then it's stored for later analysis. The measurements, they ended up taking an average based on six months that the system was running when they did this paper. They, in that time frame, they collected 10,714,784 unique IP addresses, 199,101,841 unique domain names, and you can tell almost 662 million unique resource records. During this time frame, they had three outages. The first was on October 25th, 2015. It was due during their system setup. They had an update that was not properly rolled out and it caused the system to go offline. Data for that day was not collected and they had to update their policies in terms of when updates were allowed to run. So that way the system would not be taken offline again. On December 16th, 2015, they had a hardware failure. It was found in the morning. Um, they con don't consider this a full outage because they were able to recover the system, but the data collected was not able to go through the entire seed information that they had received because they didn't have a lack of time to complete it in that entire day. Um, January 23rd, 2016, it was also turned down again due to campus data center maintenance, which is where the system was stored that temporarily shut down their systems. So after that, they made the system portable. They didn't exactly say how, but they were able to move it with one day's notice. They then decided that they were going to compare this to a passive DNS data set because they wanted to see if it was actually worth the time and the collection of going through all of this data. Um, they found that passive DNS has its own problems in collecting it. Like I said previously, it's rare and difficult to obtain. There aren't a lot of data sets out there for passive DNS. It comes with non-disclosure agreements because a lot of the data that's collected is user-based and behavior-based on users of different organizations. Laws and regulations are out there to protect personal identifiable information being sent out. Um, a lot of these, if you do are, if you are able to get some of these data sets, they have significant costs associated with doing so just because of not only the infrastructures to be able to store this data, but then you also have to make sure that you have the funds to be able to comply with the regulations for making, ensuring that the data is secure, you're not leaking potentially identifiable information. So what they did is instead of trying to obtain outside DNS data, they used data obtained from their own Georgia Institute of Technology Networks during March 2016. So they had two points of collection. One was below the recursive, which was between the anonymous clients and their local recursive DNS servers and then above the recursive, which were their local recursive servers and the upper layers of DNS hierarchy. So they collected data from name servers, top level domains, et cetera. To see some of the comparisons, the active DNS data does not fluctuate a lot compared to the passive. And the reasoning for this is that passive DNS is primarily driven by the behaviors of users. So you can see it sometimes here with this, but the IPv4, IPv6, there was a period of around March 29th where the passive dropped. Um, a lot of these fluctuate because during this time frame, the university was also on spring break. 
So at a point where it was pretty active, then all of a sudden it dropped because people weren't using the network. Um, active data cannot create as dense graphs of resource records found in passive data. And this is primarily because of its sheer size. Um, whereas the data that they were currently using was limited to just a particular organization. The data, when you go to an, an, analyze it, tends to be more dense. You can basically make some more inferences from that data. Whereas when you try to use active data to do the same thing, um, because active data scans all possible sources, including some rare domains, you may have some islands or clusters of data in that that may skew your predictions or how you think your own network will behave on that. So it is cautioned to not rely heavily on this because of that. Um, when you look at the Q-type data, this is more evenly distributed, even though the sheer volume difference, differs between active and passive. And that's because the most popular Q types were identified in this. So in both data sets, A records are gonna be your primary source, A and, and, and NS records. Um, so whether you're in an active data set or you're in a passive, those are still going to be your primary lookups. What can Thales do? They, stay, they basically made this to be able to enhance public blacklists. Why? Because Thales has the ability to store historical information between dates. So they're able to record the date it was first probed by Thales and added to the seed. And then the second date that's identified is when that domain was identified in a blacklist as a part of abuse activity. So they decided that they were going to record the infrastructure of the domain before blacklisting at use and after blacklisting. And you can see in the chart to the right that most domains were queried before they appeared in the blacklists. The only thing where the active DNS did not really prove to be better is in terms of spam. You can see that here, um, let's see, this was a, B. This was spam. Active basically pops up a lot to about 50% of it, and then it kind of drops off. So in that case, um, most of them have a higher query with up to the days leading up to in use you will see at that point, passive DNS kind of takes over. So although active is good beforehand, after the zero day mark, passive kind of leads the ability. And that's just due to because people are reporting it. Um, you could see Zeus malware um, here, phishing, exploits, oops. The difference of days, the first time a domain was seen and the days it appeared in a public blacklist. Active is here, passive is here. And then this one, active DNS, is the difference between the first date a blacklisted domain was seen in active versus the passive DNS data set. So approximately 70% of the 17,000 domains that existed were blacklisted were first seen in active DNS. What can it do? Continued, it can enhance detection of a domain's residual trust changes. And the residual trust occurs when an individual who re-registers an expired domain for a period of time, it still remains based on the domain's prior use. So if someone re-registers a domain, say within five days of its expiration, for instance, they will inherit the residual trust associated with that domain and how that domain was set up. So a lot of adversaries will exploit the ownership changes to undermine the security of both users and the system because then the domain looks like it's valid. Typically, this information is collected by Whois data 
but the Whois data is off limits to most organizations because they have a restriction that's imposed on how quickly you are able to collect data automatically from the Whois system. Also limits very frequently by registrar. It's not a central limit. Um, each registrar imposes their own rates. So while you may be able to obtain a large amount of data from one registrar, you may only be limited to a small piece from another. So what they decided that they were going to do is there was an algorithm called Alembic. It was proposed to locate potential changes based on passive DNS data and scores records based on the start of authority data. The link that I put here is a detailed paper on Alembic. The algorithm itself, um, they go into quite a lot of detail on it, so I'm not actually going to go into that because the authors of my paper did not really touch on exactly what they did with Alembic. Um, they did find that Thales can collect the same data on a much wider scale than passive networks. So they said, hey, we can possibly enhance the scoring of Alembic. So what they did is since active DNS does not provide lookup volume distributions, which is only found in passive DNS data because it's derived from the behaviors observed in the passive data only, they modified Alembic to exclude the lookup volume distribution and applied it to an active DNS set of two weeks. They found during this two week period that 99.5%, about 5 million domains had a score of one indicating that both infrastructure and SOA records had undergone complete changes since the point that they had been registered. They also found that 10,885 of these domains were on a public services list of expired domains for March 27, 2016. So they said that the remainder of the domains provide interesting cases for further study. Thales can also track malicious domains and non-routable IP spaces, which these spaces are called bogons. They are private, reserved, or unallocated network blocks. Um, a lot of the things that end up resolving to bogons are often caused by misconfigurations, brand protection services, or malicious threats. Um, Thales examined some of these spaces and found that there were resolutions to particular domains. Um, they identified two that were already known, even though they were likely inactive. One was Operation Hangover, which was an infrastructure of cyber espionage threat targeting government, military, and private sector networks with some ties to India. And then they also identified domains associated with copy kittens, which were threats targeting high ranking diplomats at Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Israeli researchers specializing in Middle Eastern studies. They also found that some valid domains, as well as targeted threats, resolved to the Bogon space, even while active to reduce their network footprint. So, some of these, because of that, they can be used to identify trademark infringements because you may find domains that are similar to active ones that may resolve to the Bogon space, but may be resembling, say, like Nike or something similar to an actual domain. Related work, um, they created a public repository called the Active DNS Project. Um, this project actively submitted iterative and recursive DNS lookups for the popular zones that they looked at in this paper, as well as the list of domain names on a daily basis. It's freely available to the academic research community for incorporation into new or existing work. You can download this data, you can access this data by registering on their website. However, it seems like this project data was collected only through 2017 
and it does not appear to have been updated since the researchers ended up leaving the university. Outside sources, they tried to look at a couple of different systems that were also out there. Treetop, which was done by a researcher with the last name of Planka, was a scalable way to manage growing collection of passive DNS data while correlating zone and network properties. Um, PassiveDNS.cn was the most successful attempt in creation of a passive DNS repository. However, it was dismissed as unreliable because the Chinese researchers that created it utilized domain records that were already censored by egress sensors in China. And then the final one was called Census, which scanned the entire IPv4 space, but not the domain space. Comments that I saw with this paper, um, not all public domain names were black, uh, not all public domain name blacklists were utilized. Only specific ones were utilized as part of the seed process. And that results in a fair amount of difference between identification times. Because while they may see um, the difference between when the seed first identified the domain and a certain period of time that it appeared on one of the, their seven blacklists, it may have already appeared on another blacklist that may have made that domain more interesting than one that may have taken a little bit longer to appear. Um, the second comment is that Thales only identifies and collects traffic on UDP port 53, but incoming UDP connections to this port in a lot of organizations are often blocked unless they're directly specified with an IP address. And the reasoning for that is that only authoritative DNS servers that provide records to the internet are required to be exposed. Recursive servers that may be on the network, which is what they're collecting data from, if those are open to the network, they'll inevitably be found by network scans and abused. And the likelihood of someone accidentally turning on or standing up an exposed recursive server is greater than that of an exposed authoritative server. Um, that's because many appliances and out-of-the-box configurations default to allowing unrestricted recursion. Um, authoritative, configure, uh, authoritative configurations are much more customized and infrequently encountered. And then dropping all unsolicited inbound traffic with a destination of port of 53 protects the network. In the rare event that they need another server to be added, exceptions can be defined on an as-needed basis. Um, in terms of the data collection itself, originally there was a lack of redundancy in how the data was able to be collected. The system was easily taken offline with minor things such as hardware failures and update policies, which had the potential to miss data and then it's no longer being updated or maintained because the last recorded period was, I think, if I remember right, April 2017. Any questions? Excellent presentation. Thank you so very much, Lisha. Um, so before I begin seeding in some ideas for discussion, does anybody have any questions, comments, or thoughts to share with the class? All right, so first I would like to ask the audience to pitch in and share their thoughts on why this paper is relevant and important to the class. Anyone? Hello. Sorry, I always have to find the mute button. Um, so my thought on this would be similar to like right now, there are websites out there that are being created to use the current health climate against people, um, either directing them to bad websites or using them for phishing campaigns. Um, there are also sites out there that are actively hosting these domains 
Um, they're doing lookups and they're posting them online. And this sounds like something that would have helped develop those kind of sites for cyber threat intelligence gathering and also for uh, protection of users against these malicious domains. Very interesting insights. I agree. I agree that this work is very valuable uh, for threat intelligence purposes and monitoring purposes, as well as a statistical data analysis and trend recognition in the cybersecurity domain. Um, Lisha, do you have any thoughts on the relevance of this work to the class? We've already discussed this online briefly, but uh, I would just like to see if you'd like to share your thoughts on this with the class. Well, basically what you had told me too is that data is the foundation to a data scientist. So creating a data set that sort of helps with all of that greatly improves our work. Well, as the source of this quote, I tend to fully agree with this. Um, so, as security data scientists, one of the biggest issues, one of the most challenging parts of our job is to curate and process data. Sometimes, and at, in very rare occasions actually, it's possible for us to find some public relevant data set that can be used in our work. Often we have to do it ourselves. And this work is a really good example of, first of all, the steps in setting up the data collection process, and second, the challenges involved in collecting data. Uh, it was interesting to see their discussion or their mention of the number of times their data collection process had to be stopped due to updates or server failures or hardware failure. And it's important to keep that in mind that these issues can uh, arise during a larger scale and long-term data collection process. And we need to account for these failures in designing our data collection and data processing uh, experiments and projects. Um, so I'm going to move on to another topic. A large portion of this paper is dedicated to a discussion on why active DNS collection is more beneficial than passive DNS collection. I wonder if they mentioned whether in the results that they collected, they found any discrepancies between records in their passive data set and their active data set. More specifically, were there any records that were present in the passive data set, but uh, were not recorded in the active data set? Lisha? After going through this, they really didn't talk so much on the detail of the records that were in one and not the other. The closest that they had done was, let me go. Basically, when they started, when they were using Alembic, they found that 10,000 of the domains were on a public services list of expired domains, but that's a big difference from about 6 million. So where did those remaining like 5 million domains go? And all they had said was that it provides interesting cases for further study, but they really didn't say anything about what, what could have arisen from those. Very interesting. Very interesting. I'm curious if any other research work has looked into this difference. This paper has a fair number of citations. So if anyone's interested in learning more about what has been done after 2017, uh, with regards to active and passive DNS data collection or the analysis of the data collected the using CALS or other, uh, other active DNS collection projects. You can check the citations. 
Um, Lisha, once again, thank you so very much for this wonderful presentation. If uh, there are no other thoughts or comments or questions, let's move to the next presentation. All right. Thank you, Lisha.